reincarnation disappointment. I said, hippie. <laughs> Instead, they're a hippo. <laughs> We are talking about reincarnation today. By the way, the jokes on reincarnation are pretty not church-worthy, I'd have to say. <laughs> but we have a couple that we'll throw in today. I'll have one more that we'll throw in today. And I think you all know what reincarnation is, right? It's the soul taking on multiple bodies, at one at a time, usually, is what they teach. <laughs> Say it again. Ice cream is reincarnation. <laughs> Ice cream is reincarnation. Uh, so, Charles Fillmore, you know, in Unity, we don't take a strong stand about reincarnation, partially because the Fillmores didn't take a strong stand. Stand. When I was in ministerial school for, uh, to become ordained in unity, they told us that actually Charles Fillmore didn't uh, really take reincarnation very seriously until he got older, <laughs> which I just love. Charles was very much into if you could purify your soul, that's how I think we would refer to it today, but if you could... Uh, I guess we could use the word purify your thoughts. If you got all limiting thoughts worked out, which is what we usually call purifying of the soul, that you would live forever. And so even with reincarnation, you'll hear the flavor of that. This is Charles. By the way, just to show you, this was published in September 1948. Charles died in August of this year. So this was, who knows when it was written, but it was published slightly after his death. God did not create man to die. Death is a result of transgression of the law. That's the, you know, the law of mind action, right? Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. When man loses his body by death, the law of expression works with him to re-embody and he takes to himself a new body. The divine law allows him to keep trying until he learns to live aright. And man will do by overcoming sin, sickness, old age, and finally death. When these are eliminated, reincarnation will be no more. Now it's interesting, I took, you can really hear, right, that it's all revolving around, we can live forever. Right? <laughs> I'm laughing because Eric Butterworth translates this to be that, um, you know, that I guess that is the way that I translated it. Eric Butterworth translates it that you would no longer need to come to this planet. And uh, that made me curious. You know, I've always wondered, why does it take consciousness so long to change on this planet? And then, what, with what Charles said, I thought, well, no wonder. Only those of us that still have something to learn are here, right? And the rest have moved on somewhere else. <laughs> so we're caught with all this, you know, ego and materialism and... Suddenly, I was like, okay, I get it. So that's what, you know, unity, you're not going to find a strong message about reincarnation. Now, in other disciplines, you do. But what does the Bible say about reincarnation? Well, the Old Testament says nothing. The Old Testament is based on when you die, you're going to be judged. And if you've lived a good, God-fearing life, then you'll be judged positively. And if you haven't, you're going to be damned to a life of damnation. You know, you're going to be down in that uh, lower quadrant where it's supposed to be hot and miserable. <laughs> kind of like what it is these days. <laughs> it's just getting worse and worse up here, isn't it? 
And this makes sense. We have to understand that uh, at least the way we view it in unity is the Bible is written by human beings. And at the time of the writing of the Bible, humankind was moving from hunting, the, the Old Testament was moving from hunter-gatherer into living in community, in forming society. And that's a big transition to make. And so the Old Testament is filled with rules and trying to guide you towards the, quote, right life. And then to top it off, you're told, and if you don't follow the rules, you're damned. So just, we just keep that in mind. No room for reincarnation in that. But we go to the New Testament, and Jesus ushers in a whole new consciousness, a new uh, what would we say, an awakening, if you will, to the fact that we have progressed enough as humankind, and this was almost 2,000 years ago, we've progressed enough that we can begin to tap into the spirit within, our true nature, because that true nature is all about living according to right action, it's all about really doing everything in our life if we can get out of the way, if we do our work. And so what then does Jesus teach about reincarnation? Well, nothing. At least nothing directly. Sort of oddly, in an indirect way, he does. But the question then becomes, was it just because Reincarnation was so widely accepted at that time that the authors of the Gospels didn't feel the need to include it. You know, the, the Gospel writers were trying to show the, if you would, the radical nature of what Jesus was teaching. And to also remember the very first Gospel was written 40 years after Jesus died. Now, that may not same, sound like too long, right? But I just did the math on myself. I thought, okay, I was 22. I had a best friend that I hung around with all the time. Can I remember a single thing he said? No, I can't, right? Now, granted, the stories were passed down by oral tradition at that time. So the stories are going, and of course, all of you keep a story right to the facts, don't you? Well, I hear some humor coming up, some laughter, because no, we don't, right? And so we have to remember that the authors of the Gospels, they had their own lens. And all of the Gospels were trying to elevate Jesus up above any of the other prophets so that he would stand out. And so we see him fulfilling many prophecies along the way. And so one of the stories that's pointed to as being Jesus acknowledging maybe indirectly that there's reincarnation, Jesus with John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist was prophesied about in the book of Malachi, where they said, and uh, you don't have this as a quote, Lisa, so you can relax. I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great day the Lord comes. So Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament, and he was supposed to lead the way. Well, who showed up to lead the way? It was Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And so everyone believes, you know, that it must be Elijah. So they asked, so the disciples asked Jesus, is John the Baptist Elijah? And he says, yes, he is. Wow, cool. He doesn't say, what the heck are you talking about? You know, how could Elijah become John the Baptist? So that seems pretty cut and dry, right? Until you start to research it. And you find out it's not so black and white. For example, when they asked John, he said, no, I am not Elijah. And I'm sure, can you imagine your whole life you know, being told, are you Elijah? I mean, you have, if you have any kind of identity issues, you might say, I am not Elijah. I'm John the Baptist. So that's one little thing 
the other piece is that, and see if you can't relate to this in the way we think about it in unity. An angel came to John's father, Zechariah, and said, with the spirit and power of Elijah, John will go before Jesus. With the spirit and the power. Now that totally resonates with me. That there is a sense of that same, you know, Elijah represents the Holy Spirit, the activity of God. And metaphysically, Elijah means he who is, uh, who lives his true nature, who lives his spiritual nature. And so actually, it's, a, it's quite a thing to be compared to Elijah. He was quite evolved. The other thing that I found interesting, so, you know, take that story as you want. The other one that I thought was interesting uh, was one of the commentators said, check out what Jesus says when he hangs on the cross, and he's got two guys hanging on either side of him. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Nice, right? But if he believed in reincarnation, and reincarnation was all over the place, why wouldn't he say, and these are my words, You'll have another chance to live a life on earth. Work it out. <laughs> right? Which reminds me of kind of a funny little joke I read. So there's this guy whose insurance company is refusing to pay for his last procedure because he believes in reincarnation. They said it was an existing condition. Which brings up one of the points of reincarnation, right? Like I always, when I was a kid, I always thought, oh yeah, wouldn't it be nice to reincarnate? You uh, get another chance to live life fully. But every single thing I read this week said, yes, you get a chance to do it anew, but it's to work out what you haven't worked out already. So, you know, just keep that in mind. You're gonna come back to this earth where only the losers have to come back. <laughs> And you have to keep working it out, you know. Of course, that's my commentary. So let's go to the book of John, where there's another example that people hold out as um, this is possibly Jesus accepting reincarnation. You can bring that up, Lisa. As he, so this is, uh, this is just a narrative about what's happening with Jesus. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. That's a key word, guys, blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Now, really cool story. And by the way, most of what we teach in unity is based on this scripture. So first of all, they're saying, hey, was it something his parents did or was it something that happened to him? Well, he was born blind. So it insinuates, right, in a prior life. And Jesus doesn't say, what the heck are you talking about? What do you mean? How could he possibly be born with something? This is his life, right? Jesus says neither of these. Again, maybe indicating that there is reincarnation. But he goes on to do something that we have used as the support for spiritual work. It's neither of these. This situation came upon him so that he might heal and understand the, you know, develop capacity within his soul to begin to mature, to progress as a human being. And this is the message we say to you over and over again, right? So you begin to see that there's no clear message about reincarnation in the Bible. However, reincarnation is talked about as long as written history goes back. And so it's in the culture. It's in our environment. And it's heavily acknowledged by other spiritual disciplines. And really, 
if you think about, like even Eric Butterworth in Discover the Power Within, we're, by the way, finishing up a series on Discover the Power Within. This is the next to last chapter, Reincarnation, says that he and his wife Olga were driving through Chicago. He'd never been to Chicago before. All of a sudden, he is naming off all the streets before they come. Just boom, boom, boom. How do you explain that? Or how do you explain child prodigies that come in and they already seemingly know? Or how about uh, past life memories? And I've said, I focus on past life memories. I was telling the staff, I went in for a past life reading. I went with a new friend. We thought we were having separate readings with the person said, oh my God, it's amazing that you're here together. You've been married seven times. I would have loved to have grabbed a stranger off the street, you know, because really? And he, she said, and you've always played the man. I thought, what? They don't mix things up at all. How do you learn? <laughs> How do you learn anything? You know, so, so I say, trust your own memory. Because goodness, you can tell this is sort of a wishy-washy subject, right? So here's where I think it gets inspiring. I was telling Luke, I took this subject on. It's not very inspiring, but it gets inspiring. You know, Eric Butterworth was a pretty evolved guy when you read him. At least as I read him, I see, wow, he's really on top of it. And so Eric says this. You're living and alive within an, ex an eternal, you're living and alive within an eternal experience without beginning and without end. Resolve to live this life and every day as if it were the only day there is, because in fact it is. Yesterday no longer exists and tomorrow and the days of the future will simply unfold out of the continuous movement of the existence that is now in its unfolding. So what Eric is saying is, you are already living the eternal life. Have you ever considered that? Do you know that every major faith believes that the soul continues on? And I think it's easy to think that your soul is fresh in this lifetime, but really not. For you see, there is a continuum that is spirit. And we are individualized expressions of that spirit that actually you can feel your soul as you move further and further out of your ego. And so the question then becomes, what is your relationship with reincarnation? And how are you living your life according to that relationship? For me, I don't spend much time thinking about reincarnation because to me, the gift is that life has been given to me right now here in this experience. But what Eric is beautifully pointing out is that we are in the midst of an eternal life. And if we're not happy with what's happening in our life now, we might as well explore it now because it's eternal. <laughs> it is a flow. Even if there is no such thing as reincarnation, you go on. Not with your memories, you know, there's a lot of stuff that falls away. But your consciousness goes on. The character of who you are goes on.
And the other thing that's quite impressive to me is what can be accomplished in this lifetime. I've said it many times, I'm just astounded at the change in my life since I launched onto the spiritual path and launched onto it seriously. But we are so good as human beings at postponing. Oh, I'll pick up that meditation thing next year. Maybe tomorrow. Oh, I don't really want to look at that, and surely it's not that big of a deal. I, I, I just only snapped my partner's head off. I'm sure they'll get over it. But do you see, everything is offering us an opportunity to free ourselves and to continue to free ourselves as we live this eternal life. And frankly, if my eternal life was like it was when I came into spirituality, ew, it, would, it would kind of feel like I was going down into that hot spot. But it's become quiet and still and peaceful and joyous at times and exciting at times and so much less worrisome and heavy and, you know, feeling like I've got the weight of the world on me. Just the simple realization that I'm enough as I am comes from our spiritual work. So, if you believe in reincarnation, great. If you don't, that's fine. But because you're sitting here, I know you all have some sense that the soul goes on. And remember that you are already living your eternal life. You may have been living it for 2,000 years. And here, you're given the opportunity to do something through Elijah, interestingly enough, because you see, Elijah is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit in action. We always say, the cool thing about being on this planet is you got hands and feet. You got a voice. You can make things manifest. You can discover just how magnificent you are already. I think that's the opportunity. And so this week, I invite you to consider how am I making use of eternity here? How am I making use of the gift of life that I've been given? This is amazing. So that when I do lay this body down, I've done everything that I could do here as I move on to who knows what. And there we have it.